Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to CMC. I, I haven't been up here for a while. It's good to see everybody. Uh, I'm Mo Wright, uh, Media Past Chair of the Board of Trustees. It is good to be back uh, here at CMC and to see all of you today. And now to uh, introduce our forum for today, please welcome Darcy Congro, Managing Director at GBQ. Darcy. Thanks, Mo. And thanks to all of you for being here for this really important conversation. Uh, Andy and I were talking before the forum started today about workforce issues in our city, and our workforce issues are certainly very, connect very connected to our transportation issues, so we're looking forward to hearing uh, about that today. Uh, civil conversations each week at CMC are important to our community and help set the tone to move forward together as friends and neighbors. Strong public transportation systems are a hallmark of great cities by making transportation affordable for its citizens. Advances in technology are rapidly changing transportation means, but efficient movement of people and goods remains fundamental to our economy and to our quality of life. So we're excited to hear uh, what the future will hold here in Columbus and to explore these questions with opening remarks by the new president and CEO of CODA, Joanna Pinkerton. And then she's gonna join Alicia Schneider, the new CEO of the Matriots, uh, for a conversation. Let's welcome them both. Thank you, Darcy, and thank you for that one wonderful introduction about transportation. I feel like you kind of embodied the, the entire opening of my remarks, which is <laughs> transportation is really important. Um, but I'll get to that in a, in a moment. I do want to thank um, the Columbus Metropolitan Club um, for asking me back. I was here a few months ago and was on a panel uh, discussing workforce issues related to how smart cities integration of technology can actually affect um, our workforce and population. I also want to thank the Board of Trustees at CODA. We had a good board meeting this morning, and I am really honored that most of them were able to attend here today for the luncheon. also want to acknowledge um, some of the CODA team. We have, I think, two whole tables here. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us and celebrate with us. And I'm also going to call out some former colleagues at The Ohio State University, because I see about two tables of you here. And I thought I'd just call you out right up front uh, to keep you in line and keep you behaving. Um, but what's important about that is they, along with many other large um, organizations here in Columbus, are representing this groundswell of support for mobility and transportation and making sure that Central Ohio is germane to the conversation. And actually, in my vision, that we're leading that conversation for the nation. So thank you for being here. So mobility is vital to our community, right? It's every aspect. If we can't move, we can't live. It's our economy, uh, our health, our quality of life. And I think the opportunities ahead of us are really exciting, but the stakes are very high right now. There's a lot of disruption, and I think the disruption is positive. I think it's ours to capture, it's ours to own, and it's ours to lead the conversation. We will be the region's mobility leader at CODA. There's no doubt in my mind, and we're gonna build on the strengths of a really robust capital program and capital assets that already exist, and the talent of our more than 1,100 employees. A positive trend that's happening right now, and I think it's representative of every one of you who is willing to sit in this room and talk about transportation, is that people kind of get it all of a sudden. They're excited. I mean, for those of us nerds and geeks in the transportation industry, um, been in the engineering community for 20 years now, we think this is really cool. But the fact that you think it's cool too um, is a real paradigm shift. So we'd like to um, engage in more of this support um, for investing in what matters. So let me give you an example of that, a real example that this community is facing right now. Um, Amazon, as you well know, is searching for a location of their second corporate headquarters in North America. It's a $5 billion facility with more than 50,000 high paying jobs. And what is one of the major requirements for them to select a site? Access to mass transit. So that's an example of corporations understanding that it's more economically sustainable to have high capacity movement of people preventing fertile land from being put under in parking lots and from avoiding uh, inevitable gridlock that we're all starting to experience 
reducing pollution, and allowing the companies and the communities to take that money and invest it elsewhere, like critical community assets. And that's not an anomaly. You're going to see that a lot more moving forward, where companies are trying to get out of the business of owning parking structures and parking lots and just finding ways to help get their employees to work. So code is a bit unique. Uh, recent surveys, we have found that more than 50% of our riders are using our system for transportation to work. That's very different than most major cities. So we're glad to see that trend um, as being a, an asset for employers. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce just released a report in their four-point plan for rebuilding America includes investing in mass transit and making sure that we can move volumes of people. So how do we continue to build that transit system? I want to introduce three concepts that I think are really going to impact the mobility industry. Technology, data, and collaboration. Now you will notice that not a single one of them is a vehicle or a mode, or a type. These are the disruptions that are opportunities for us. So technology, it's so common to us right now that we forget that it even exists, but it's a huge enabler. Imagine the fact that you can FaceTime someone on the other side of the planet right now just because you want to. Or Airbnb, for example, one of the largest companies in the hospitality arena right now doesn't even own a single asset. They're a technology platform that connects users and owners. So now it's our turn in the transportation industry and government at large to become smart and nimble, just like the private sector has done. Integrating technology into our practices is going to be the standard. So technology is already enabling some new features at CODA. For example, the CMAX service that we just opened January 1st relies on uh, traffic signal prioritization. So the geeky side of me says, do you know that traffic signals are mostly dumb? You know, they just kind of rotate. But this is where the buses and the signals can actually talk to each other. Uh, watch out for later this summer, mobile payment will be coming. So just like you can buy something on iTunes, you'll be able to buy something to get on the bus. Uh, we're, we were one of the first transit authorities to enable Wi-Fi on our entire system. And now we're providing real-time information to customers via an app or digital displays at our bus shelters. So that's technology, but think about all this tech. The other part of that is data. What do we do with all of this information that's coming at us? When you think about it, our current vehicles are just a 40-foot computer on wheels. They're constantly connect, collecting, generating, and synthesizing data. But like any government entity, our, our traditional method of using the data has been to report historical. We can tell you how we performed, what we performed, where, where we were, and what we did. <clears throat> and you hear the word smart a lot right now. <clears throat> Pardon me. And what smart means to me is where we actually harness that data and begin looking forward predictive analysis, future trends, so that we shift in government from being reactive to actually proactive and planning ahead. I see a couple heads nodding there. I think we all want that. Um, so that's going to be a really big challenge for us to change into a more nimble system than just a historical reporting system. But let me give you a really good example of something the team here pulled off just last year. <clears throat> the first transit system redesign. First time in 40 years that the system was torn apart and redrawn based on where people live and where they work. Think about that. First time in 40 years. Now, a lot has changed in this community in 40 years. And we were the, one of the first in the country to do that. And actually, I just found out recently that New York City has been looking at ours and they are gonna go through a transit system redesign. So all of a sudden, we're the cool kids, and New York City wants to be like us. Uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, um, you know, we can't wait another 40 years. We can't wait another 40 to redesign our system. We have to become nimble and agile and use the data in real time based on how our system is performing and make adjustments to that in our operations. So the ability to harness that data is going to be really critical. So one of the things we know about our new transit system redesign, with one redesign, more than 100,000 people now have access to our high-frequency routes that did not have that access before. That's a 71% increase 
of Central Ohio residents who can now get to high frequency just by one tweak. Now, one tweak, I saw someone flinch. I know it was really painful, right? <laughs> really painful to rip the entire system apart, but uh, probably next time, the next time will be more of an evolution. It won't be an entire redesign, right? Um, and then high frequency routes are now available to 103 more, um, an 89% increase in um, access to jobs. So there are 103,000 more jobs within proximity of a transit line now. I mean, that's a complete and utter paradigm shift that a job and a home is closer to the system. In another example, I learned that our maintenance technicians are now working with manufacturers on predictive analytics, looking at how we can actually prevent the breakdown from happening before it actually happens. This is a really common practice in smart manufacturing and nimble um, places that actually produce things. So for us to be able to look at our own operations and say, we're gonna prevent that from breaking down because we know at this interval, we may have a challenge. These are really creative and innovative things that our people are doing already. And I think the sky's the limit. <clears throat> Lastly, I mentioned collaboration. We already collaborate, but let me assure you that we are going to continue to enhance our collaboration efforts. Recent examples are a C bus downtown, Air Connect service to the airport, and if you're not familiar with Rickenbacker, we now run transit to Rickenbacker um, Intermodal Logistics Park in the southeast portion. Smart Ride, we now do employer-based transit to New Albany. And CPASS is launching in just two weeks. All of this is based on partnership with the economic development community. So they are coming to us proposing solutions that allow them to actually market our community better. We will also be more proactive to break through to new customers who still do not have access to CODA. We're looking at trends of how shifting people and new uh, research just released this month shows that a third of people using transit are also using other mobility as a service or transportation network companies. So we're engaged in a first mile, last mile study led by our planning department with working with all of the suburbs to try and figure out how it is that we can use those type of systems as a feeder to get people to our transit systems. Imagine where there's a seamless system, no barriers to switch modes, no challenges with different payment systems. You can just get where you need to go based on whatever transportation access is available in your community. That's a real paradigm shift and that will require collaboration across private companies, governments, cities, and um, entire regions. And I think we can accomplish it here in Columbus, particularly with a lot of the work the Smart Columbus team has already tackled for us. We will benchmark and learn from other agencies. There's a lot of amazing things going on in the transit world right now. And we will be figuring out um, collaborations with vehicle manufacturers. Uh, we have already been talking to them about how we can implement new technology like collision avoidance, collision avoidance assistive braking, lane keeping, to keep our operators and our passengers safe. In all of these notes I took today, I want to point out these are just based on meetings I had with my team this week. And it's only halfway through uh, the week. So those are just some thoughts that I had about technology, data, and collaboration. And I wanted to conclude and let you know that um, I think it's so essential for CODA to explore these collaborations. Um, it, it's really an unprecedented, unprecedented time for us, and I think this next year is going to be one of the most impactful we've ever had. It's going to be a year of discovery for us. And I also want to mention that today is my one-month anniversary at CODA. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> so if you'd like a little more detail than that, uh, give me another month, and, uh, and you can look me up and I'll give you some more specifics. Come on over. Okay. <laughs> so four weeks. Yes, huh? Yeah. Um, I first want to start by saying as a member of the search committee, I can tell you um, that the whole search committee um, and the board is so excited to have you here and in this nice. position. And it was a pleasure to go through the interview process with you, which is um, not always the case if you've sat through um, several interviews uh, before you know that. Um, so first question, I, um, I'm recently obsessed with Mr. Rogers. Um, and I've been reading a lot of books and biographies about him, and so I'm going to make a connection here um, to transit. It's not going to be the neighborhood trolley, but um, 
Yeah. Um, I, I reminded you no. of Mr. Rogers. I, was, I wasn't making <laughs> No, no. Um, no cardigan today. So, um, no, but in sincerity, um, one of the concepts that Mr. Rogers <clears throat> teaches is a concept um, where you look for the deep and simple rather than the shallow and complex. And I think uh, in, in our current landscape, um, transportation as well as, you know, just in general, right, in the world that we live in, um, so much is shallow and complex. And so thinking about CODA and transportation in general, um, what's CODA's deep and simple purpose and how do you put that into action? <clears throat> Well, that uh, is a very challenging question uh -huh. for um, fourth week on the job, but um, so CODA, our purpose is to move people and provide access. I really think that that's, you know, that's our purpose. Um, but I think that the deep part of that is it's our job to lead the mobility conversation. And that includes creating a seamless system, like I mentioned before, that might seem abstract. Um, but you don't want the, the, the technical and the shallow and the complex, we can do it. Our organization is very, very well run and um, quite impressive, the in, um, intellectual abilities that preside within our company. I know we can do it, but we have to do it. We have to connect everything. So I think connecting everything so that everyone has access in an equitable manner, that's our purpose. Good, thank you. Um, so, so moving on into um, the lady power question, right? I'm so happy that we hired a woman. Um, uh, just period, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's fair. Um, at, um, at the Matriots, we have a, a saying, when women lead, Ohio prospers. And I am certain that um, uh, when women lead, CODA prospers. So I'm excited. Um, uh, to have you in this role. Could you share a little bit about another woman leader that's made a difference in your life and has helped make you the very best person for this role? I have to choose just one. <laughs> I mean, we've only got um, 10 more yeah. minutes. So let me just start with um, a big paradigm shift in my career. I am an engineer by training. Um, was when I had to, actually I watched one of my projects canceled. Um, <clears throat> due to a federal issue, ended up having to testify in front of the EPA, all this stuff. And here I was, this really junior engineer in my 20s, and I was so intent on, well, this is what's right. How is it that all of these people, these abstract politicians and policy makers, you know, canceled this project? And um, there was a woman uh, who was the first woman ODOT director, mm -hmm. Jolene Mola Torres. Mm -hmm who I met through that process, and she said, why don't you work for me yet? And I said, well, you haven't asked. <laughs> Guess where I was working about six weeks later. Um, so she was interesting because she threw me in the sh deep end of the swimming pool, and I see some faces here of people I worked with, other women. She did the same thing to you. And she didn't, she didn't uh, sugarcoat anything. It was your job to figure out and navigate. And that was one of the most challenging experiences of my life to enter an organization of over 3,300 highly technical, highly skilled engineers, mostly licensed, mostly men. And one of the first one to come in my office said, am I allowed to swear here? Can, it's a quote. It's a, uh, I don't know. Okay, don't, it's don't recorded. It out. He said, who the blank are you? And who do you think you are talking to my engineers in my district? Mm -hmm. And with no bias, I just said, well, this is who I am. This is what the director told me to do. And here's the solution I'm trying to accomplish. And to this day, he and I are good friends. God love um, you. Well, I, you know, we no, had to work course. together. Of course right? she did, right. So um, she really set the, the stage for me to learn very quickly at a young age that you just have to deal with whatever bias is out there and not let it be a barrier. Just open that door and usually people will go through it with you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about funding. I am uh, personally a big believer that a community should be able to invest in what's important to them. And I believe that CODA is the linchpin of this community and obviously important. Um, so thinking about that, what's the funding future of CODA look like? And what do you need from us? What do you need from this community, Franklin County residents, private support to make CODA the very best that it can be? Well, if I would have known you were going to ask that, I would have come with a list. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, I was on a call last week and I was really excited that CODA was included. The American Public Transit Association mm -hmm. um, held a call. They've issued a report about the Im economic impact to the nation right now um, because of the state of repair of the nation's infrastructure, including transit. We are faring a little better than a lot of our peer cities because we're newer, uh, we're a little smaller, we're, we are a bit more nimble, and they're facing a backlog of infrastructure funding. Um, found out that most other states, like Georgia, Pennsylvania, they have state capital budgets for transit, and we don't. We're, we're locally led. So thank you to all of you here in this community who have said transit is a priority. Our, lab, our levy two years ago passed by more than 70 some Overwhelmingly. percent. Overwhelmingly, yeah. So the community here has already said it's important. I think that it would be okay to have that conversation at the state level mm -hmm. to see if that is a uh, solution, not only for workforce, but as an economic development tool to make sure that at Ohio is an attractive place for companies. Um, and then I think we need to look at the surrounding areas around um, Central Ohio to see how they might be able to contribute. I also am a big fan and a big believer in value capture mechanisms. So working with our development community, if there are cranes in the air and things are going vertical, they need to be working on all of the horizontal, not just transit. Infrastructure needs to be funded up front in a sustainable manner. So I think capturing the value of all the growth right now is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. So not just transit, but including transit. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, so moving on and talking about riders. Um, riders are often um, in the transportation conversation spliced and diced into choice and non-choice and millennials and all the things, right? Um, and I personally have this dream one day of public transit being thought of like tap water, right? That we have one amazing product. Um, for all citizens. So thinking about that, um, what are you seeing across all types of riders? What are their attributes, needs, and desires of all riders? And I, that's not to say that everyone um, is exactly the same, but what are the commonalities that you see of riders in Franklin County? So not just Franklin County, but um, Masabi just came out with a research report last week mm -hmm. that says the number one priority for people to be comfortable in transit is convenience. The slight fluctuations in the cost all of those other things, it's convenience. How easy is it for me to get on? How easy is it for me to figure it out? And so I think that is not unique to a certain demographic. That applies to millennials who are really willing to stare at their phone and figure it out sure. eventually. Um, but think about like the older generation. My parents aren't real comfortable using transit because they use it so infrequently. Mm -hmm. Um, so making it convenient for people, speaking to them and meeting them where they are, whatever mechanism that is, whether it's a phone, whether it's information sent to their house, um, and having events. We ha actually have a, a process to train people who use our paratransit, right? That's very specific to that service. But imagine if we all just knew how to use transit because we'd been trained to. So I think we can do a little bit better job. We have an amazing marketing campaign coming up. And it lets people know we're there, but I'm looking forward to the next evolution that actually shows you how to use transit. Great. Um, next question is the light rail question. That way it doesn't have to come from the audience here in a couple of minutes. Because um, <laughs> frankly, let's be honest, right? Um, so in Columbus, rail seems to be a um, four letter word. Why is that? Um, as we grow and change as a city, what is your plan to lead high capacity transit? What does that look like from CODA's perspective? Am I allowed to make a joke? It is a four yeah, letter yeah. word, R-A-I-L. Well, right? sure, yes. <laughs> 
Um, so so um, I didn't dive into mode um, for a reason. I think it was back in late 99, maybe around 2000, there was actually a ballot initiative in this mm -hmm. area to do light rail, and, and the voters turned that down. So our commitment at CODA is we know what type of services to provide, uh, but it would, we would need community support yeah. to say that there is a specific mode. So if you're not familiar with, it's worth looking into the next generation of Insight 2050. Morpsey's uh, study with the Urban Land Institute projected almost a million people moving here in several hundred thousand jobs in the next 30 years. And if you're, if you're flinching, it's because you're thinking, how will we handle that growth, right? So that has been done. The next phase of the mm -hmm. study are major corridors. We are participating in that study. What's different is it's not just transportation. There will be scenarios based on land development densities that will tell you the cost of the water, the sewer, the transportation, the, the transit system. Mm -hmm. And then we as a community will get to decide, how do we want to build? Do we want to sprawl and pay the extra cost for that? Do we want to be dense and invest in specific transit-oriented mm -hmm. type and activities? the first Insight 50 um, uh, study did suggest that people do want to be moving into more dense, dense scenarios and not into a sprawl, so sprawl scenario. So I, I point that out because mm -hmm. I think if you're not familiar with the study, go to their website, check it out. I think the outcomes of that, what the community adopts, will really influence the mode, including whether it would be rail. Um, next question, you've talked um, some about positive disruption, which is a really fun way, I think, um, in an interesting way and perhaps a challenging way, um, or maybe not challenging, but a different way um, perhaps than CODA has been looking at change in the past. Um, I know that one of the things that excited me um, was that you really are a, um, a change agent. So. Um, Thinking about that, um, talk to me a little bit about um, the coming change and managing through that change. Well, I'm a big believer in uh, Nimawashi. I worked a lot with Honda, maybe that's where that comes from, but that's the concept of just having a hallway conversation or explaining things to people. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is a very structured organization, but I believe in very cross-functional open dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little scary yeah. to come from outside of an organization and enter the organization and people not throw up barriers, right? Because it can be scary to have a new leader or to have a new teammate. So I've tried to open those conversations, and I, I would expect that our cross-functional teams will actually be the ones implementing um, all of the major change. It's not just me. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we can all um, get on board with that philosophy, I think they'll be the ones to help make the change. Thank you. Um, so it's just about time for my last question or two. Um, we're going to move to audience questions in just a few minutes. So um, if you'd like to step up to the microphone over here on the side of the room. Um, we'll be taking questions um, in a couple of minutes. Uh, thinking about, you've talked some about um, the transit redesign, so I want to talk a little bit about the new downtown transit pass program, um, which I believe launches June 1, which is like in a minute, mm -hmm. right? Um, We're ready, oh. right? <laughs> yeah, of yes. course you are. Yes, I wasn't going to ask that, I was going to assume that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the team's uh, taking yes. notes. Um, thinking about that, tell me about um, CODA's preparation for that and involvement in that and, um, and how that um, is sort of tr changing perhaps your perspective a little bit, or maybe it's not. So I think this is very representative of a fundamental shift of companies and businesses and property owners and developers and community citizens understanding that they have a role in funding transportation. Think about this. The, the companies and the employers within the downtown special improvement district are paying for their employee, employees to have bus passes. That's a big shift. So yeah, it is a big shift. I'm really, um, really, really impressed with the development um, community and also the major employers downtown who are saying, we do not want to add to congestion. We do not want more pollution downtown. We don't want to be paving parking lots. We want more functional housing, more 
more jobs. We want things to go vertical. So look at it as a two-year experiment uh, where we will learn a lot from this about who begins to use it, who shifts their behavior, and it will tell us a lot about what to offer in the future. Yeah, I think it's really interesting from that culture shift um, sort of potential. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see it as well. Um, tell me a little bit about what has, so four weeks on the job, right? Um, uh, what surprised you? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> well, there's a funny story, but I don't know if I can tell that one. Um, We're all friends here. Uh, <laughs> all right. um, it was 4 a.m. on my first day. We decided to meet with everyone, so made ourselves available, the entire team, for 12 hours a day for the first two days mm. so that we could meet with employees who work different shifts. and. One of our most spirited employees came right up to me and told me that I look so much better in person. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that was a little bit yeah, of a surprise yeah, sure. that she was just willing to say it. So um, I took Code it as a compliment. Employees are honest and authentic. Yes. I um, think it's what that says. But, but really, that was an indication of people have been very welcoming mm -hmm. um, and willing to share. So even if they are concerned, they've been willing to talk about it, if they have ideas. So the openness of the culture, I'm really pleased with that because we're, it's going to take all of the ideas to coming together to make this work um, as we evolve, as we grow in this community. So I, I've been really pleasantly surprised by people's openness, even though sometimes what you hear is maybe not what you were expecting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A little Midwest authenticity yes, maybe, very right? Much. Yes. Um, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Um, please state your name, um, ask your question, and uh, first person can move up to the, the mic. Please, um, I'll remind you, in fairness to everyone, uh, we'd like to get in as many questions as possible, and so please avoid editorial comments. I will cut you off if I feel like I need to. Um, so let's get started. First question. Hi, Greg Brown with the Graham Family of Schools. Uh, Joanna, Elise, thank you for being here, and congratulations on your major anniversary. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, about your comment on Amazon. You said that Amazon is looking for something certain, uh, some certain something in public transportation. I'm wondering what that is, as far as you know, um, if we have that in Columbus, uh, if not, if it's something that we want to have, um, and if that's the case, what would it take to get us there? Okay, so the request for proposals, that process is um, a very closed process, so Amazon has not disclosed <clears throat> whether or not the concept put forth in Ohio is adequate, but yes, they do recognize us as having mass transit, so that's good. Um, also think about the fact if you put 50,000 jobs at one place at any time, whether it's Amazon or any other company, that's going to require an evaluation of your system. So I know that the officials at MORPC and CODA worked together to put a concept in front of them that was agreeable. And then that would be something that if we were fortunate enough to be the next headquarter location where we would have to find a way to implement that in a time frame uh, that it, worked with their construction timeline. So they recognize our system as being robust enough, as it is, as long as we can modify. And I would point out that our new service to Rickenbacker and our new service to New Albany are examples of meeting major employer requirements. Uh, so can you share what that concept is? That I actually am forward? not privy to that. Um, that, was, that was done through a private firm that brokered the deal to Amazon. I've not read the proposal. Okay. They will make you privy to that before you have to implement it? Oh, um, <laughs> if Amazon were to select uh, Central Ohio, then that's where the negotiations would start. Thank you. I think that's part, right, of, of the challenge each time an Amazon or a DNC mm -hmm. or any of these kind of big opportunities, which thank God Columbus is now, right, part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago, we weren't it, sort of in the mix at all, so that's really exciting. Um, 
but, but it's hard with those closed processes, and I understand why those processes are closed, that there's a lot of mystery, there's a lot of talk, right, about um, why or why not um, on both ends, even if you're successful or not successful. Um, and, and I think we need to be mindful as a community that, um, that we're being um, intentional about how we talk about uh, the outcomes of those kind of situations. So. Well, and I was glad that they did acknowledge that our system as it is now runs well enough that we were a candidate. So that's, that's a really good sign. Next question. Hello, Joanna and Alyssa, how are you? Hi. <laughs> you do look awesome in person, by the way. Oh, just, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask any question you want then. Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned a really important uh, set of words in your opening, and you framed it with respect to disruption and the disruption that we're experiencing in transportation in general. And of course, I know you well enough to know you mean in general all the technological areas, whether it's manufacturing, education, transportation, what have you. I'm wondering if you could talk about a little bit more about your future vision of CODA and what that means with respect to data, analytics, and that disruptive factor that we're experiencing right now. Well, I'm not sure if we have the image currently that we are that nimble and innovative organization that can harness the innovation. Uh, I know we're capable of it. I think we're seen as a best-in-class operation, and we've earned that. But there's plenty of best-in-class operations that, you know, probably aren't in business anymore. You know, whatever their uh, their issue was, but. Um, I think to change our image will be representative of the things that we begin rolling out. And, and I hope that we will do a better job as a community bragging about ourselves. But for us to be the first in so many innovations already, like the Wi-Fi, I don't know what um, will be probably top 10 for the mobile payment, but all of these systems that everyone expects to be normal, they take a lot of work behind the scenes. So I think it'll be, um, my vision is that we'll, we'll change that image and people will think of us being that first response. CODA knows how to solve this problem. Yeah. Hi, next question. Uh, my name is Rory Krupp. Um, I hear more and more anecdotes about people who won't take the bus because such and such population is on it or likewise. Um, how do you get over the cultural stigma of public transportation? Get on the bus. <laughs> um, I <laughs> I mean that sincerely. Um, I, I think um, a lot of our inner dialogue about um, people in poverty or people who are other, right, um, is increasing and we're, we're finding more and more ways to divide ourselves um, and, and we're not spending time in places with people who are other. Um, and that makes it real easy for people to not understand other people. And so um, the bus is the very best way, in my own personal opinion, as a resident and a rider, um, to, to really know and understand your whole community, not just the people who live in your subdivision. Um, and so that's, that, that's my response to somebody who says that to me, and I hear that as well. That's an excellent answer. Good. <laughs> I don't think I can top that, but um, let me go Gosh, back to the can. convenience factor. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes that's used as an excuse. And no one likes to be called out for not being smart or not being able to figure something out. And one thing that's um, interesting to us is our experiments that are coming up of times that people can use the service like for free or like a one-time experience, because um, it takes that fear factor away. So. <laughs> I, I hope she won't be upset with me, but um, I have a friend who got on the bus the other day. She got on the wrong one. And of course, she would, it, the whole experience was ruined for her. She was embarrassed. Um, she had to talk to the driver who, of course, was wonderful and helped her get onto the right system. But for her, it was, she didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the people on the bus. And it wasn't so much about the difference of people, and it was, I don't want to be the one it, it was about her. So I think as we eliminate the barriers and make the convenience factor more, then people will have to adjust to uh, any barriers they have in their mind. I think also building on the, the sort of convenience piece um, is trust, right? I think um, 
and, and not about trust about one another, about one writer to another, but trust in the system, um, in the, in CODA. In yeah, um, I think that that's part of, um, at least the initial attraction um, with uh, programs like an Uber and a Lyft, right? Is that trust, you can literally see it coming, you know it's coming, that's a level of trust, right? At the deep and simple, that's what I think makes a system like that work. And so as CODA continues to build that trust, um, I hope that also sort of helps um, increase ridership. Chris? Uh, Thank you both for being here today. Um, glad you threw out the light rail thing, so I had to at least ask some kind of question to follow up on that. Um, I think you made a great point saying that the last ballot issue was 20 years ago, and we also talked at the same time how far our city has come in 20 years. Uh, and so I guess knowing that we're doing this Insight uh, 2050 corridor follow-up, um, where do you see CODA's role in, in talking about a next it doesn't have to be rail, but the next high capacity corridor, what's CODA's role? What's your thoughts in talking about funding? Who would you like to see as partners? How do you have that conversation? Okay, that's enough questions. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> So I think CODA's We've only role, got six more minutes. Um, so. And I've intimated that uh, we're but really a, a best-in-class operation, and I've seen the technical skill set of the people in-house. So I think to the extent that our role is to contribute to that study, to say, here are your options, and this is what it will cost. And then it will take civic leaders, it will take the development community, and it will take people who currently pay a tax structure that pays for certain services to, to decide um, what type of upfront investment they would like to, to be made versus the long-term sustainability. So we certainly can provide the upfront expertise. Um, we're getting much better at our government affairs uh, with the addition of some real talent. And um, so it, it'll be up to us to lobby people a little bit. Of course, we're gonna push for people to do high capacity. It's much more sustainable. Um, but the community, the development, and, and even the individual people who make lifestyle choices will have to decide how they want their money spent. Seeing you back when we have that study done. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no doubt, right, that this is going to take a community champion mm -hmm. and it's going to take um, community support and probably a levy, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of different public private partnership, but any kind of high capacity transit, whether you're talking about like rail, streetcar, um, uh, BRT, any of those are going to take some, some initial funding and a rail commitment from this community to decide to join every other large city. Um, in that commitment. Hi, I'm Steve Next Weiler. Question. I'm with Huntington. And uh, there's a special person in the audience whose mission it is for uh, CODA to be free to the ridership. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. So the question was um, about free ridership for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I know that's a conversation happening right now within the development community, and I referenced earlier what a paradigm shift it was for downtown um, employers, property owners, and developers to shift the burden of transportation costs to themselves to have a positive outcome for their employees. Uh, I think that conversation is happening in the development community. We certainly will stay abreast of it. Um, the most important thing to us is the long-term sustainability. Because once you make something free, then people will always want it to be free. And so we will want to make sure that our revenue streams pace with the growth that we're expecting and we're not capped. So we'll stay involved in that conversation. Uh, but right now I haven't seen the finances to actually um, weigh in effectively. <laughs> so I'm going to pull the four-week card out right now. <laughs> yeah. I think speaking of community supports, um, I think part of making that happen is a commitment by this community to decide that public transportation is important and valued and part of what we offer to each other, whether you have a car or not, right? That that's part of who we are as a community. And that's gonna take a culture shift to get there. Um, I also always like to, to remind um, folks that uh, you know, most riders are also taxpaying people who vote on those levies as well and are paying in in more ways than just when they ride. So um, that's something to think about too in that conversation. Yes, hi, uh, Andy hi. Campbell. 
Um, quick question, it's actually about safety. I think a state law was just passed and there's discussions at the federal level about having seat belts on school buses. I know COTA transports some of the kids. I wonder your thoughts of that in regards to is it actually safer or maybe the costs and challenges into implementing something like that? Wow, that's a very technically oriented question. I know that's been a debate for quite some time on school buses um, and so for our system as well. You know, I'm sure there's pros and cons regarding the safety of the vehicle itself and, and emptying the vehicle in case of an accident and people being able to actually remove their seatbelt. I don't have statistics with me, but um, the fatalities that are happening in single occupant vehicles are much higher than are happening in um, a bus or a transit system. You know, when we do hear of that one bus having an accident or that one train, it's on the news because it's novel, it's, it's unique. Whereas, you know, today in Ohio, three people will die in a car. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the ugly statistics. And so that's why NHTSA and the government has mandated seat belts in single occupant vehicles. So I, I suspect that without the data in front of me, um, our accident rate just isn't at a level or at a severity that they've been warranted yet. All right, so thank you so much for this conversation and um, I, I certainly think I, I speak on behalf of the search committee that we are so glad that we found you or that you came to us or however it really, really it's Beecher Hill actually, shout out to the, um, the, the firm. Um, but honestly, it's just um, from, from a citizen perspective, exciting to see um, someone new with um, energy and enthusiasm and a new and a fresh way of looking at transportation at the helm. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And, with and we echo, echo that thank you. Uh, let's also thank our sponsors today, GBQ Partners, IGS Energy, Huntington, and the Robert Wilder Company for their support. And to our uh, girl power dynamic duo, Alyssa Schneider, uh, Joanna Pinkerton, thank you so much. We'll see you next week.